library connection. And um, in 2001, after 9-11, in Broward County, where I was working, I was working in South Florida, I got a call from the <coughs> Broward Community Foundation, and they said, can you design a workshop so that the nonprofits in our community could work with each other because now there's a lot of competition. All of the money that used to come to nonprofits in our community is going to New York and to Washington and to the other sites where 9-11 occurred. And um, if you can remember back to that time, it was, a, it was a very difficult time for the nonprofit sector. And so I invented this process called Full Act Planning Series. It's a, a series of workshops to train folks in collaborating so that they could leverage the existing assets in a specific community without having the need for more money. There wasn't any money. So the, the goal was to connect and leverage existing assets, materials, knowledge, people, connect people with each other. It was very <coughs> successful. So since 2002, when I did the first workshop, over 1,200 people have been a part of these workshops. And now I think I can go to 1,300 after today. The other thing is that over 600 organizations have collaborated or met each other in these workshops. So it's had a tremendous impact on people who have been in this. We also have a series of workshops here uh, that's funded through the Creative Campus Committee, and it's called Collaborating with Strangers, and we'll tell you more about that. But this is a la that kind of workshop. We're just doing it for the class, as opposed to having a separate workshop and inviting you all to come to that. And then what we'll do is I'll give you the instructions on what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it, so you can relax for a few moments. And then I'll also pass on this slide presentation so that um, the professors can link to it on the, um, on the web. So this is the premise that we're trying to achieve here. You can, you can do a lot of things by yourself, but you definitely can't be a successful grant seeker all by yourself. This is not a sole art form. It's a team activity and when folks start to work in the grant-seeking world and they think they can do it by themselves, they fail. And part of that has to do with now, sponsors and funders are looking to leverage their dollars. And they want to leverage their dollars across a community and not just an individual. So if it's an individual research, researcher doing their own thing and not working with anyone else, it's not such an interesting proposal, and the funder can't spread the money in the way that they're wanting to spread it, and having the impact on many entities rather than on just one person. And also, if you want to jump in, uh, Jared or Jennifer or Dan, please jump in. So the four basic ways that people work together and this comes from research done by the, by the Wilder Foundation, uh, are in these areas. Co uh, cooperate, coordinate, collaborate, and mentor. And you should use these words correctly when you're writing your grant proposal. So if you say that you're going to be collaborating with someone, you want to really know what that means, as opposed to that you're just cooperating with them. To cooperate with someone, is very little risk and takes very little planning. So if I show up at a health fair and I pass out flyers during that health fair, that's cooperating. It's no big deal, I know what time it is, I'm gonna show up and do that. If I'm coordinating, I would say that this process that we did today was a coordination because there were many emails back and forth with Jennifer and with the team here to make sure that the profiles were correct. There was lots of planning went into this. I have my team, and my team was planning with the professors on this team. So it's a higher risk, but it's defined as coordination. And then at the end of this, we'll probably have an ongoing relationship. But I'm not changing the way I'm doing business. Collaboration actually is the way you change business to work with another entity. It, it's a lot of risk 
and it's deep work. It takes a lot of planning, and I'll give you an example. There is um, a small museum going out of business, and their materials are coming here. And that's collaboration. We, it's actually a merger between their previous site and coming in and working with us. It's, it will change the nature of the libraries to have these museum materials available. And also, all of the people that worked in this museum are coming as volunteers, and we're not going to lose them. We're not losing that community. That is an integration process. That is collaboration. It requires a lot of conversation. So if you're going to be writing grants, and you use the word collaboration, just like you would, OK, I'm going to meet you, you know, or in a casual way, then you can get yourself in trouble. Because you really want to, if you're going to collaborate with someone, use the word correctly. And, um, and show what the, what the benefits are and the risks are that you're taking with, with this approach. And then mentoring, the additional thing of relationship that you have as an option today is mentoring. Because look at how many people are here. I would just say this is a group of sleeping assets. You don't know each other. Would I say that most of you don't know each other? Is that correct? Um, and if you don't know each other, then you definitely don't know the talents, the skills, the resources, the networks of the people that are sitting next to you. Am I correct? So you don't know their passions. You don't know why they're taking this class. You don't know a lot. And it could be that there's someone here that can mentor you on X, on a tool, or on some way of doing something. So those are the four methods or relationships that you can have with others. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about a couple of stories. So this collaboration story, have you, have you heard of the cows on parade? Have you seen maybe in different communities around the country where there's an alligator? I think we did we alligators here. Alligators. Right, so this started, this process started with a collaboration in Chicago. So there was a businessman who went to Zurich, Switzerland. And in, in Switzerland, they had placed 815 of these fiberglass cows all over Switzerland as a promotional tourist thing. And this, this businessman came back to Chicago, and Chicago has a history of having, it's a cattle town. Originally, it was a cattle town. So they replicated the process, but created this huge economic driver to get people to come downtown during the summertime when nobody wanted to be outside. So they put 315 of these cows in kind of a parade downtown Chicago on the main street. And each of the cows were sponsored. And each cow had an artist that was assigned to that cow, and that artist was paid to do that, to design the cow. And lots of agencies were involved. The Tourism Bureau was involved. The Arts Council was involved. Um, the Chamber of Commerce was involved. All the businesses were involved, and then 1,500 artists were participating in creating these cows. The economic impact of that one event was $100 million. And that came from one idea of someone who went to Switzerland and saw these cows and said, OK, we should do it in Chicago. Now if you think about it, how many communities around the country have benefited from this concept of these fiberglass animals? And how many artists have benefited from this initiative. So all it takes is one small idea, and then a community of people who hook into the idea and say, this is great, we should do it. It's high risk collaboration, right? Another one is the Museum of Science and Industry in Tampa. How many of you have been there? It's a really cool place, right? So this is not a collecting museum. It's an exhibiting museum. and. The executive director lived on a boat for two years just to see if he could. So he's a great adventurer. And um, so he started in, in, at Mosey about, I think he's been there close to 30 years. And because of his interest in collaboration,
operation, he brought a public library into the museum. So I think this is the only museum in the country that has an operating public library within its museum. And you can check out lab equipment, you can check out microscopes, you can check out telescopes because of his vision. I think this is the only museum also that has a Head Start program as part of its program. And they have two charter schools that operate within the museum, a middle school and an elementary school. And so you can see how the leverage of this one museum is benefiting the community in a very deep way, unlike other museums who might want, not want to take that kind of risk. So, if you look at those two examples, and in your mind, think of the comparison between the two. You have to know your own assets. What are assets? Can anybody give me an example of an asset? Skills. I'm sorry? What else? Skills, knowledge, abilities. Yes. Time. Time is an asset, right? Money. Energy. Energy. Education. What about a facility? Is facility an asset? Yeah. Data. 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 Data is an asset. Anything that you have at your disposal that you have access to is an asset, right? Most people don't know their own assets. Most people don't know the assets of people sitting next to them because they're strangers, right? You're in a big community here at the University of Florida. How many of you know all the assets that are available here? It's tough. You have to know your institution's assets as well as your own assets. All the people that are working with you, wherever you end up, you have to know who they are, what they're good at, and what assets they bring to the table. And then the people outside of that, the universe outside of this. So, I wanted to talk about um, disadvantages. Of, I'm not sure if I have the slide in here. Okay, looks like I don't. So, how many of you know what this cooking tool is? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so I would consider that the seven people in this room are advantaged, right? Because you know, actually know the purpose of this tool. And, you, and you've probably used it, and you know its benefits, right? So the rest of you, the rest of the 70 people in the room don't know what this is, and I would consider you to be disadvantaged, right? So you're disadvantaged in the fact that you don't know what this is, so therefore you've never used it and you've never benefited from it. Let me do this one. How many of you know what this is? One, two, two people. Again, another proof of disadvantageism, if we wanted to say. Most of you don't know what this is because you probably never had a need for it or never used it. So this is a garlic peeler. You put the piece of garlic in here and then you roll it and it takes the peel off quickly, so you're not sitting there all day. And this is a clarinet swab. It removes the moisture from inside of clarinet. So I guess you learned two things today, but the point is that these are metaphors for showing you that if we are people who don't know what we don't know, correct? We don't know what we don't know until someone opens the door for us. So being curious, being inquisitive, wanting to know about someone else, or wanting to know about something else, is the key to developing collaborations. And if you don't have that as part of your nature, it might be good to work on that. Um, if you think you already know what you need to know in this life, to be successful, I would say that you're missing out on a whole adventure of things that you don't know anything about. And you won't know because we can't know what we don't know unless we start to explore and, and continue exploring for the rest of our lives. So that's, that's my
my personal philosophy anyway. Okay, so I think we're ready to do the speed meeting. And I'll give you the instructions. The first step is that everyone is going to get a checklist. And does everyone have a pen? If you don't have a pen, we can loan you a pencil for today. But I'm hoping everyone has a pen. And if I can have my pencil. So I have a whole team of folks here from the libraries. And um, couldn't do it without them, definitely. So each person's going to get a checklist.
dry because we didn't bring enough water for everyone. So, yes. You guys could all take the backpacks and zip them up and put them underneath your seats so they don't get kicked around. If any of you still right. have computers out, make sure the plugs are put away because if I kick it off, I'll feel bad for about two minutes. And then what we're also going to do is you're going to put your desk down.
collaborations come from two people who have the least in common. So the theory is, that I'll just finish this concept and then Jennifer I'll, uh, will let you talk. So um, there's a book called How to Think Like a Genius or Think Like a Genius by Todd Siller, S-I-L-E-R. And his concept, he was the first artist to graduate from MIT. And his concept is that genius comes from taking two things that have no similarities whatsoever and creating something brand new by combining them, combining forces. So if you have an artist here and you're in biochemistry, that's where the imagination comes in. That's where the creativity comes in. How do you combine forces with that person's assets to create something new? Today, you're really not looking for to the answer to that question. Right now, you're learning about the assets in the room, the sleeping assets that you don't know anything about. That's what you're doing in this session. Jennifer. Just a couple weeks ago, I had a meeting with the Harm Museum. You all know I'm a scientist, and the Harm Museum wanted to talk to me about how we work together to get art in the park and get students involved in creating art that also has a scientific bent. And I never in my life thought that this is something I would be doing, but it's meeting that person and talking about things and saying, we can do something together to bring the harm closer to the natural areas on campus. So just anything can happen, and you never know. They might only be in art, but you might really need somebody to graphically display how DNA twists, right? So they need to work with us, something like that. That was a great question. It was a great question. Any other great questions? They're all great questions, right? I mean, that's my philosophy. It's all about the container and the question. Yes. So what are we supposed to do with the checklist? The checklist? You write notes, let's say you meet number 31, and you, you want to remember something about your conversation. You don't have to write the card because if you, if we're going to put them up on the online community, we're going to scan all your cards. You don't have to take notes about that. But if you want to remember something about number 31, then you write it down on your checklist. Other questions? Are we ready to go? Okay.